I'm Daniel Weinberg, and we're coming to you as always from Chicago, the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and from our broadcast studio embedded in our shop. You know, we're an 83-year-old antiquarian shop specializing in American history with specialties of Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, and the U.S. presidency. We carry both old and new books in our fields, as well as many historical artifacts, original historical artifacts from those days or from any particular presidency as well. Autographs, photographs, statuary prints, and much more. And we have some of these artifacts and we'll show them as we go along if they relate to some of the questions that we have for today's book and author. So visit our website, alincolnbookshop.com to purchase a signed book uh, of, uh, uh, of today's book and uh, watch our past interviews on YouTube and our artifact discussions are on Facebook. Well, today we have a fascinating book I think you'll enjoy. Uh, Jeffrey Frank is a former senior editor at the New Yorker and deputy editor of the Washington Post's Outlook section. Currently contributed to the New Yorker and has written for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Guardian, Book Forum, Vogue, and other publications. He's the author of I Can Dick, Portrait of a Strange Political Marriage, and has written four novels, among them the Washington Trilogy. And he's co-author with Diana Kronfrank of a translation of Hans Christian Andersen's stories that won the 2014 Hans Christian Andersen Prize. Now his latest book, The Trials of Harry Truman, which I'm showing you here, The Extraordinary Presidency of an Ordinary Man 1945 to 1953. Simon and Schuster publication, 528 pages illustrated, and is $32.50. You will get a book plate uh, until authors start coming around again into our studio. You will get a book plate that's signed if you uh, order a book from us, and uh, you'll get one of these special book plates that are, are ourselves alone. I love the dust jacket, uh, Jeff. The, it's, I, but I wanted to ask, did the Beatles steal this image? <laughs> it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful picture. It's a little bit of a cheat because it was taken after he was president, but, it was, but there he is walking in Independence Square in, down in downtown Independence. And, when he, and, 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 that's, and that's, the, that, that, that's the way that's the way he appeared. If, if you were lucky enough to have a sight, he wasn't out all the time. People, tourists would have loved to have seen more of him, but he wasn't going to go out and walk around for them. We were speaking before our show and that we noticed a period after yeah. the S, which we never thought was there. Uh, but you tell us that he had done that once and the Truman Library thinks this is correct. Well, I asked them, I said, there's been, uh, can, can we settle this once and for all, or at least sell it temporarily? They said, no, there's just a lot of evidence that, that, that at the S, the first place that Truman actually signed his name with the S sometimes. Sometimes it, it, his name would all get scrunched together and you couldn't see, but, it, but, and, so, but I think it's the preponderance of the evidence says that the S belongs. He actually, it actually does not stand for any particular name. It, no. He had two, no, two, 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 uh, two, 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 two grandparents, uh, uh, and but that's, but that's, but, but they were real people, and so, so, so S and the S without a period would have just looked completely odd. So that's why I think Truman started putting it in. So that's all I can say. But anyway, I go along with the archivists and independents. And, right. uh, so it's, it's, well, it's I found a, this, uh, Jeff, an excellent read. It truly was. Well, especially uh, with all the quotes that help the narrative move along. So I enjoyed reading from things that were behind the scenes when I was a, a child. So it's kind of interesting to have delved into this. Now, I wanted to ask you, there are many, many books on Harry Truman. Yeah. Uh, many know David McCulloch's especially. Uh, what brought you to this book? Why Truman now? And how does this book differ from previous books on uh, Harry Truman. Well, uh, David McCullough's book was a biography of Truman. This is a biography of a presidency. So in that sense, it's, it's a more limited, more limited book, um, even though I do have a long prologue, which brings him 
brings him brings him to the to to the farm to to World War One to the Pendergast machine and so on. But it's but and I think it's also I realized more and more as I thought about it. Well, two things: one that I had finished this book on Eisenhower and Nixon, and I thought that and I was already and I found Truman kept showing up. Um, he was so so in a sense Truman was a natural prequel to the to the uh, to Ike and Dick, and also the I just thought everything. Our entire world came from that period, and it was, and I and I didn't realize it until I started getting into it. It was seven years. This I I had cold feet more than once. This was just the, everything happened then. Everything happened. Uh, the I mean the, the two wars ended. The atom bomb was dropped for the first and I hope the last time ever. Uh, NATO was NATO was formed. The civil Truman sort of began sort of pushing for civil rights, even though he was not a great, he he was not a great uh, supporter of of. Uh, of, 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 I mean, he, he was brought up in a segregationist, let me put it out, a segregationist environment, but he did it anyway. And, um, and there was, everything, um, everything we, we, we have today, this, the, 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 say the alliance, the, the, uh, and, and the, the sort of shape of American politics was sort of formed then too. Uh, we have yes. a, the, the, the real, the, a democratic party that doesn't, doesn't exist anymore was, uh, but, 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 but you could see the, you could sort of see the, the, the new Republican Party, the Goldwater Party, formed then after the 1948 convent, 48 election when the when 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 the South walked. And that you know, made, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party of his day, neither of them are the same today. No, uh, no. So things have changed. What was his education? Uh, you write that there were gaps, uh, and where did those gaps reveal themselves? Were there consequences from that as his life went on? Well, he was, he really was a, 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 he really was an autodidact, an auto, auto, autodidact, and he, but he, but he read and read and read, and that was real, he read history, he didn't always read it the way we would read it, but he read it, but he read it, he read it with extraordinary interest, and I, I found, I found one letter, with, right in the middle of the Korean War, he was suddenly, he was suddenly discussing a, a sort of ancient, a battle in ancient Greece, he just couldn't stop. So he was. So he was definitely someone. He, he was, and he was deeply engaged by the presidency. Other former presidents sort of fascinated him, and he would. He would. He would actually, in his diary, he would write about. I hear the ghost of, of Andrew Johnson walking through the White House, or or, or this or that. And he was, and it was very, very moving. He, he he felt that he was part of this, and he also felt that he also felt that he was in a way a separate separate from this. He also he would say that I. I, I try to always remember that ha I'm Harry Truman, and that there's the president, and the sec and, and the person sitting in this chair could be the president, and and, mm. and, and, and so on. And he would he would separate himself from the office. He, he had real reverence for the office. You um, you just said something before about uh, Southern qualities imbued in him. Uh, yeah. We of course here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop studied the Civil War, yeah. uh, but Truman's people lived through the Confederacy and the war. Uh, what Southern thoughts uh, did, were imbued in Truman when he was a kid? Uh, the Kansas, Nebraska troubles still resonated in his household growing up. How did he get around that? Well, he didn't. I mean, and, and I think that I think that he, you know, he, on the farm in Grandview was forty miles from from uh, from Lawrence, Kansas, where they were, where Quantrill had that, that massacre, and he basically grew up in a house of Confederate sympathies. He had Confederate sympathies, but he but he he evolved, as we would say today, and he never he, he actually um, and he never he never he he never evolved to the point where he wanted social equality with blacks and whites, but he but he wanted. Fairness. He wanted fairness between black and and he wanted he wanted he wanted fairness in the law. He was deeply moved by the by the brutality, by the lynchings in the South, and by and and by a, a, a particular case where a where a GI coming back from the war was blinded, intentionally blinded by a sheriff in in South Carolina, and that 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 got to him. So and and so by 1947, despite the, despite the complaints actually of, of of one of his sisters who said. Um, who said Harry will never will, will never do this sort of thing? He actually came out very strongly for some for, for, for what was then a, a, a real a real change in 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 civil rights. He had you know, interstate interstate travel, um, and uh, and he uh, and he actually he appeared on a stage with Eleanor Roosevelt, Walter White, the head of the double NAACP, and Hugo Black, and 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 this was a real step forward for him. And then and then he actually commissioned a, a panel on civil rights. And uh, so it was. It was something for someone of his background. He never got over his 
his attitudes. He never, he never liked the idea of interracial marriage. He couldn't stand that, but he, but he wanted, he understood he had a certain duty to history and he tried to do the right thing. And he really wanted to do, he wanted everyone to have an equal chance. And that was, that was real. There were, of course, uh, I was going to ask this a little later on, but since you brought it up, the uh, minorities, how, how often did he really interact with minorities? I'm thinking of two that really feature in your book. One, of course, uh, are African-Americans. You've just spoken about that. And how about the Jewish population? He had a, uh, a partner who was Jewish, and that certainly uh, interceded in certain areas when he was president. But did he have a life with minorities at all? Well, well, he actually he got to know Catholics during the First World War, and you know, I was he actually he actually almost joined the Ku Klux Klan I mean, long, long before he, when he when he found out they didn't they didn't want to help Catholics. He he wanted no no part of it. He had Jew, he had lots of Jewish friends. I found the most interesting thing. I don't know if you whether you spotted it. It was in the prologue, and I, I I never tracked it down. But it was a story in the Kansas City Star. I guess right after he was elected to something, maybe the judgeship, and he said he would go to Passover in the Independence with a Jewish friend. And this is this was I, I didn't know there were any Jewish people in Independence, and and and, but, um, and, and he was so that was one of Truman's friends, and and, and his friendship with with, with Eddie Jack, Jacobson was completely real. He had no social interaction with blacks yeah. that I can see, yeah. none. He actually, and, and actually, with his and his few, uh, he was he, he felt he felt friendly toward Walter White, that's for sure. And he felt extremely angry about Adam Clayton Powell because Adam Clayton Powell had called, had referred to his to best Truman as the last lady, not the first lady because of something she had done. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us about his character. He certainly was a direct person yeah. and uh, usually honest. Uh, I know that with Abraham Lincoln, Ward Lamon, one of his colleagues uh, and private protector uh, said that he could, Lincoln could stretch the truth when necessary. Uh, what about Truman? What was his Truman, character like? Truman certainly, no, Truman could stretch the truth too. And, and Truman would also, I mean, he, would, he would remember things that never happened. I, I was fascinated to find in one of his late books, he would just, he, he carefully described a conversation he had with Roosevelt discussing, dis, discussing history. He'd never, Roosevelt had never, and Truman never had, would have a conversation like that. They had one meeting together, a lunch, in, the, in August of in August of 1944, before the election, and he would they would he would show up at the White House, but 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 Truman would would sort of wanted this to happen. He, and he wrote about it as if it had happened. To give, I mean, to, to, to I will say that it was many years later that he wrote about it, but he really wanted. So so that really meant, meant a lot. He would definitely stretch the truth. He would also inflate himself. Uh, there was an early um, there was an early early meeting with Molotov, who was the foreign minister for the for, for the Soviet Union. And this was very soon after he became, after Roosevelt's death, and he referred to a, a conversation. It was not a pleasant conversation, but Truman said, I, I, was a, I gave him a right left to the jaw and put him down. And, and, and that, that never happened. One of his aides said Truman did have this capacity to sort of inflate his, um, his, his, his um, what, what he said and, and, and did in, in private. And he could stretch the truth somewhat too, but he was, but deep down, he was an honorable man. And that's the thing about that. That's the that's why you that's why you that, that's why you end up like that's why I ended up liking him. He is this his character about being so direct that that get in conflict with others because of that they couldn't see past that. It sure. I mean, he he was also, but it, it, but it, it also it also helped him. It helped him with the voters sometimes and so on. And he and of course and of course his directness, his temper could also got get him in trouble. I, I was I, I when I was I was at the Washington Post when Paul Hume was still alive. And I never asked him about that famous letter that Truman sent to, sent to him. So I was speaking about another, another example of directness. He was, he certainly was, he, and, and again, he would, he would inflate himself. And, and that, there's no question in, in the Potsdam conference after the war, when he met with, with Churchill and Stalin in, 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 in Potsdam, and he would, in his diary, he would, in his letters, he would say, I told Stalin this, and I, I would tell him where to get off, and he got off. Well, if you look at the the transcripts of the of the of the Potsdam conference, which are not perfect, but there's not a hint of any of any of that. And and in fact, in fact, he was always full of sort of nice things about Stalin, uh, uh, Uncle Joe. He always thought that Stalin was was being run by this by this mysterious Politburo, as if Stalin was a was sort of helpless helpless before before their power. How did how did Churchill and Stalin treat him? I mean, he was new to things. 
when yeah. he had to meet them at the beginning of his presidency and near the end of the war. Wasn't done yet, but tell what, what, how do they treat him? Well, I think actually, is it, I, mean, I think Churchill got really mistreated by Roosevelt and Stalin in Yalta. That was far more, they treated Truman with great, with great deference. He was the, after all, he was the president of these of this wealthy, powerful, emerging, uh, I mean, emergingly powerful, is that a word, is that a word, a powerful nation. And it was something to really, Truman, I think Churchill, Churchill really, really founded on Truman for, for the future of England. England, the, the United Kingdom was dead broke. And he actually said at one point, you know, we're going to need your help. It's, I, I say, I say, it almost sounds like a, a senator from a state hit by a tornado asking for, na asking for, a asking for a national emergency. And Stalin, Stalin, it's tough. Stalin basically, I don't think Stalin much liked him or, ha or had a great deal of respect for him, but he didn't, and he would become impatient with him, particularly, I say, particularly during the pot, maybe during the pot, that was the only time they ever met. And he definitely got angry with him uh, from, from afar uh, because of after the, his, confrontation with his foreign minister Molotov. And also he got, he got very upset when Truman, understandably so, when Truman invited Churchill to come to the States and, and sat on the stage and applauded when Churchill basically attacked Russia. But, yeah. um, but, but they were very, but they were deferential to him. They understood that the world had changed. And, and they also understood that, uh, that, uh, that America had, for a while, America was the, was the, Un, it was was the power. America was the only nation that had an atomic bomb, and that counted for a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, you have a wonderful photograph in your book uh, of Lincoln in a car touring uh, Berlin. Yeah, it reminded me very much of Abraham Lincoln, who toured Richmond right after the war. Yeah. So, uh, well, the war was still going on, but in, he, he went there in the beginning of late. In the March, beginning of April, April fourth, to be exact. Um, so I can only think of that. Watching that, what were Truman's thoughts on this visit to Berlin? Did he did it change anything? Did it anger him? How did he feel? No, it's interesting. I was, I was, I kept hoping that he would say something really interesting. He said, said it just shows when people. It, 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 this kind of tragedy happened. He wasn't very interesting on the subject. He didn't seem terribly moved by what he'd seen either. Others were. Mm -hmm. I mean, Germany. Berlin was a was a was basically rubble, and people yeah. were you could you could see this was some amazing footage from that period. You could just watch people sort of lining up and passing food and water and bricks and so on. And it, and and I and Churchill Churchill actually rather enjoyed it. I think as as uh, after having having what England had been through. I'm sure. But I don't think and I, so. It, it wasn't I, you can't. I couldn't compare it to Lincoln's visit to Richmond. First place, Lincoln was visiting. The, they were his countrymen still, and he was yeah. and he was their president. These this was the enemy, the really hated enemy, and and uh, and they had and so I think so I think Truman just just said, well, you know, this is what this is what happens if you overstep, and uh, mm -hmm. as as he as he felt they they had in a bit. Did he meet, Did he go through any of the camps at the time? No, no, never. I, yeah. Eisenhower did. Eisenhower did. There's a famous right. quote. Eisenhower came out this first time and turned to said, "Do you hate them now?" <laughs> Talking about the Germans, the right? Adam now, exactly. Yeah, and he wouldn't Which shake the hand. Of, yeah, I'm sorry. No, I'm saying that he he wouldn't shake the hand of 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 of, of the man who came came to just bring me the, the peace treaty, or he just he found a way to avoid that. No, uh, since we're, since we're talking about his character, what about uh, his humor? Uh, I have a a letter of his in our stock right now that does to Roger Tubby, a friend of his, and this is in '53. And, and I also want to read this kind of quickly. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, your first editorial, which was not enclosed, you instructed me to read it, but I didn't have. I but I don't seem to have had an opportunity. And then he says on because um, Tubby was taking over uh, the Adirondack Daily Enterprise, and he says in an autograph postscript, "Be sure to pay a lot of attention to local situations, parties, weddings." Funerals, valedictorians, parent teachers associations, Knights of Columbus, Masons. Be personal and accurate and leave politics to national issues. Roger, this is an ignoramus talking to an expert. What was his humor like? It comes through in this, certainly. I think his humor was all, it was there, it was real. I mean, he, would, he was great at, 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 self, at sort of self-deprecating self himself. And he, uh, I think there's one place where he talks about the, 
the, the sort of the people in short tur turning out to to see the president when he comes to town. He said, this, "Oh, everyone's coming out to see the Cardiff the Cardiff Giant when he shows up." He sort of he sort of made fun of himself and this and the and the, and the idea the the idea of people going out to see a, a great man. So he he had a great sense of humor and it came through all the time. Some of his and even and even unintentionally, I I love that he, there were there were these two very powerful colonists, Joe Alsop and Stuart Alsop, and <laughs> referred to them as the Sop Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it was very funny, and it was, and, and he, and it was almost inadvertent. But it, and he was, he didn't like them, but still, it's a great coinage. And I saw, so he had, he had that talent, and, uh, and he had that. Before we get to the presidency, which is your book, basically yeah. the, the theme of it, um, tell us how he came up through the Pendergast uh, machine and Tom Pendergast, and of course he got into the Senate partially because of them, but then seemed to be able to wean himself away from that the second term. How did he do that? How did he blossom in the Senate? And was there anything you see there that from the Pendergrass time to the Senate that foreshadowed that he could be whom he became in the presidency? Well, he, yeah, I mean, he, he, was, he was loyal to, to the Pendergrass. After he got, after he won this, his, his Senate seat, he had a, he put a picture of Tom Pendergrass on the wall. And, and he, that, that, <laughs> He owed, he, owed a, he owed a lot of people for his first for his first Senate seat. He owed a lot of a lot of people who found votes where they might not have been. But he but he I think his real and when he came to town he was he was really looked at as a as a provincial in debt to the machine. But I think you know I think his real breakthrough his real he 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 became a real senator in this in in his second term which he just squeaked by again, and that was when he that was when when he started the, the Truman Committee. Which was basically to look at waste and fraud in in the defense, and that was before the war. And then he kept it up during the war too. And uh, and it was it saved millions of dollars, and it was and it was a it was it was the real thing. And he uh, and he got the cover of Time magazine, as uh, and he was so this, this 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 the Truman Committee was really something, and that sort of made him a more, much more of a national figure. And that's and then he became a real a real senator doing. You know, trying, trying to, trying to do, trying to do real, get real legislation passed, and that was something that the first term you didn't see so much. In the first term, he was, he had a great time. He had a great time when he was vice president. He had three months of, of parties and, uh, and sort of, yeah. and sort of, yeah, and, and, and going, you know, going, having opera singers sit on the piano while he played and so on. That was, uh, no, that was, that was great. Being, being a senator was also was also fun for for three months, and then suddenly. Suddenly, suddenly is sorry the cliche, sorry for the cliche, the roof fell in on him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, he was kind of schizophrenic about uh, regarding himself when he became president and the office he held. He had to keep reminding himself, as you write, uh, yeah. that he was president when reacting to events. Did he find it difficult to keep his personal feelings from intruding in either policy or when dealing with individuals? You have to remember, oh, yes, I'm president. I can't just go off on, on people. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think he, I think he was, again, I think he was, he was pretty direct. I, I don't know, I don't know really know where his personal, his personal feeling would come in. The only case I can think of was the, the big case was in the rec recognition of Israel. And that was, that was, that's, that's fascinates me. I, I fascinated because I don't think, because I do, I don't, I do think it was, it was personal. I do think it was personal. I do think that Eddie Jacobson had a role. Um, uh, Margaret Truman, his daughter, said that that's nonsense, but it's not nonsense. Um, for all I can, for all I can see, he visited Truman fairly frequently. He went and he visited Truman in, in Key West, which is not, uh, which was, which was something that people, outsiders and lobbyists and so on, wouldn't do. So, and and he really, he really liked him. And I think, and I think he was very affected personally by the, by the, by the sight of the refugees in Europe after the war. So that was that was something that was his, that was personal and that was real and I think that and that that was uh, and he that was the only time where he where he went against the advice of Dean Acheson, uh, who who basically was his chief and only advisor for the second term and and and, and General Marshall who was who was in, who was enormously influential and who Truman almost I would almost say I I almost say had a man crush on George Marshall, and uh, and and both and they both came they both were against this of uh, early recognition of Israel so that's yeah. where Truman's feelings took over. Yeah. Um, you've studied both Eisenhower and Truman, and they came to the presidency from different angles. Uh, what are the difficulties uh, of becoming commander in chief, a politician becoming commander in chief, versus a military man having to become a presidential politician. 
how do the two of them cope with those differing role, historical roles that they themselves have? Forgive me a bit of Eisenhower discussion now, because I just, I, 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 feel, like, I feel as though I got to know him. And I think, I think for Eisenhower, it was almost a step down. He, he had made the really big decisions. The, um, the Operation Overlord was a really big decision with the lives of, I don't know how many Americans, I mean, how many, how many allied troops uh, were, were, were at risk. He, after, he, after the presidency, he wanted to be called general, not, pre, not, not Mr. President. And, but he was still a politician and he had to be one. Yeah, and he was, and he was also, and he was, we were really lucky to have him at, at that time. I mean, I'm thinking of the wars we did not get into because of Eisenhower, Eisenhower's president and so on, particularly in, in Indochina and so on. Truman had to learn how to learn how to do it. And he, and he went very, he went on instinct and he learned and he, and he, and he, and he didn't always have great advice. And he had some really strange cabinet choices in his first term, having Having Henry Wallace, the Secretary of Commerce, was, was a strange choice. Henry Wallace was a rival for the president for the presidential nomination, and uh, he'd been the vice president under Roosevelt. And suddenly, anyway, anyway, so suddenly he was Truman's Secretary of Commerce. It was not a happy relationship. And then Jim, and then James Francis Burns, Jimmy Burns, that was also that, who was desperately jealous of Truman. I think because Truman, because Roosevelt had picked Truman over him as for vice president. And every time I think Burns looked at him, he could say that could have been that could be me, President Burns. But of course, it was never going to happen. How, how about his commander in chief? He had no, I mean, he he had some military experiences in right. World War One, but he now all of a sudden he was commander in chief. It's like right. like um, Lincoln again. He was a private in the Black Hawk War, and that was it until he was commander in chief. Yeah, and he had to learn. He read tactics and all of that. Although things were much closer. But how did he? How did he act as commander in chief and learn? Well, he, actually, if you think about it, though, all he had to do was sort of close down two wars. The, the war in Europe was basically over when he was when Roosevelt died, and the war in Japan, he had to make one big decision as commander in chief. But it wasn't much of a decision. It was made for him. It was going to happen. He, this was the, the bomb was you know the 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 uh, the, the uh, interim committee had said couldn't they couldn't no one was against using the thing. Um, the target committee had picked, well, they picked Kyoto as a first choice. So in a sense, so, but, but, Truman, but Truman basically said, yeah, we're going to go ahead. Well, he, he couldn't resist the, the, the generals the, 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 uh, and plus years and years of, of, of planning. And he was persuaded that, you know, that, that a half million lives would be saved by using the bomb. So it really wasn't, it really was not a, a decision. And he just said, do it. And then, and in fact, I'm not even sure that he, he even gave the decision for the, for the Nagasaki bomb. And then, and then that war was over. His biggest role as commander in chief was Korea, and that was that was a, that was a big. Yeah, deal. we have to that get was, to that. Yeah. Uh, I did want to show, since I have it here over my shoulder, uh, the famous Chicago newspaper, the Tribune, made this mistake: Dewey defeats Truman. Uh, it's interesting that it was put together very quickly uh, in the early morning hours here in Chicago, and uh, Harry Tribolet, their stringer in Washington called them and said, no, it ain't true, don't do it. But they'd already gotten this out to the burbs and into yeah. Michigan, uh, the outer suburbs got these early uh, newspapers and that's why Chicago didn't get this. There had been a newspaper uh, employee strike. So some of this is upside down. They, they put it together so quickly, <laughs> the editors came down there uh, and they put it together and did it wrong in some instances. I once had one of these years ago wish I had it back. Uh, I've had a couple of them where Truman has signed the newspaper, yeah. but uh, one of them, uh, someone knew both Dewey and Truman. And so he had, it went to Truman and Truman signed it. This was a mistake, Harry Truman. And then Dewey, the only one he signed, he said, it sure was Thomas <laughs> Dewey. But, but uh, Truman did sign, he was in uh, Missouri when this when he got one of these papers and he signed this, the photographs, this came from a newspaper itself and he signed many of these uh, really briefly. How come Dewey didn't treat, defeat Truman? <laughs> oh, I see, well, because Truman got more votes. Okay, that's easy enough. <laughs> no, it really, it, it really was, it, it, it wasn't even close. That was the interesting thing about it. It wasn't even close. Truman, I mean, the, Truman got, uh, Truman won, he lost Congress in 46, terrible, 
terrible defeat of, of, of almost a vote of confidence of, or no, a vote of no confidence. And in 1948, he got the Senate and House back along with winning the presidency. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a great, a great victory for him. And, uh, and, and that, that paper is really, that's a beautiful copy you have. I, the copy of the Truman Library is sort of more sort of beat up than that one is. And there are very, very few of them because as you, as you said, they were, they, just, they were just sent out to the suburbs and, and uh, it was just a very early edition. So right, there's no- right. yeah. And uh, you know, they, they're gonna be fewer as time goes on because the yeah. pa newspapers are acidic. It's I know. Paper. And they're just gonna continue to eat themselves out from the inside. Uh, it's gonna take a while, but it's gonna be done. You can get letters and newspapers, I should say, from George Washington's era or yeah. Abraham Lincoln's era, and they're in perfect condition because they're ragged and they're just in perfect condition. So yeah. these are gonna, they need to be deacidified if you're gonna keep them. But since we're talking about newspapers, let's talk about the press. What was his relationship with the press, both before the presidency and especially during it with news conferences and perhaps after? What was his I did, what was his relationship with the press going on? It was, I, I love this subject, so I'm gonna stop me if I go on too long. He had, he basically had a press conference almost every week. And he, and he I think he kind of enjoyed it. He enjoyed reporters, he was friendly with some of them. And, 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 he, and they, they gave him a tough time, but he was, but he, but he they were, they knew, he, they recognized socially I and mean, who they were. He, he, he didn't much care for the columnists. He had, I mean, someone like, as I say, he mentioned, he called, uh, the Alsop brothers, the Sop sisters, and uh, and and Walter Lippmann, he just couldn't stand. When Walter Lippmann sort of Walter Lippmann turned at the very end, Walter Lippmann began to find some virtues in Truman, but he thought he was just a media a mediocrity. But the but but the the average reporters who who maybe hadn't gone to college, who basically were working for not not, not much money, who were slaving every day, and so on. Truman liked them, and they liked him, and it showed. And he never and he didn't duck. He didn't duck them. He didn't go. I mean, the idea that. The idea that of, of not he, he actually said at his last press conference he said nothing nothing is more more valuable than, or not, 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 but he said the value that we have of, of being able to ask a president directly face to face a question is a very an amazing thing we have in this country and he and he and he and he's always and he kept he kept that going he did not care for the owners he didn't care for the Hearst he didn't care for the he, he, he didn't care for, for Roy Howard, the Scripps Howard people. He didn't care for the, and I say he didn't care for the columnists who were often, but they were often from a different social class than Truman and that, that showed. The, so, uh, you, write, you write about his last presidential year, the last 10 months, certainly, he, can, yeah. he became kind of shaky uh, yeah. and wasn't exactly himself. In what way, how did it affect his decisions and did it affect him, his relationship with the press as well? I'm not sure it affected him, but you could, yeah, there was one press conference that I quote toward the end. He's very shaky. He doesn't seem to, he doesn't seem to even know something he, 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 he was recalling something he'd given, he'd given Stalin an ultimatum. Well, he hadn't, he hadn't given Stalin an ultimatum, but and, and he, he was, and he was, and he got sick. He, he had a terrible, he had a terrible flu, um, and, and I think in the, in the summer, in the summer of 52, and then he had the steel strike, which was, which which didn't have to happen. It was a, it didn't it, it, the the uh, the steel. He sees the he sees the uh, the steel factories and 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 basically sh and and uh, and the Supreme Court basically said said no. And these are this was the Supreme Court of his his appointees, the Roosevelt's appointees. Uh, one one justice compared the he said just compared this the sort of thing that George that George the Fifth would 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 do. And uh, so mm -hmm. he was uh, so he he had a very shaky. Last term, and then and then Korea wasn't going well either. It was it was going better than it, it, it's it, it, it's worst time. The worst time in Korea was the fall of the fall of winter of 1950 when it looked when 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 it looked when it looked as if it could it could all go it could all go bad. That's that's when the Chinese came into it. Despite you, warnings, yeah. you mentioned that uh, in here how he didn't travel to he, he did certainly travel to uh, to be with MacArthur. Yeah, and that was very consequential, I presume not only to their relationship and politics, but afterward, but also to the war. Uh, how did that go? I'm not sure that it really, I'm not sure, I'm not a, why, that's, that, he actually traveled, he actually traveled by propeller plane to Wake Island and back and spent, and spent maybe four or five hours there and, and maybe an hour at the most with, with MacArthur, there was a meeting, an all hands meeting and then a couple of rides and nothing was accomplished. Uh, there was a, Truman had an election coming up, which this, this, this didn't, 
um, the, the, the 48 Light, that, that didn't help him. Um, he, I'm not sure what it accomplished, but I thought Truman just, Truman said, it's important for me to meet my general and talk, talk to him, but then nothing changed. And then afterward, he felt that he'd been completely betrayed by MacArthur. But he didn't really go into Korea and see it. Uh, no, no, no. And you do kind of mention that if he had gone, you intimate that my perhaps God. if that he was... had seen it and how close China is, uh, perhaps he would have not, not go both feet into that war. He might have. They, they met. The thing is, to, it's also important to remember that when they met on, in Wake Island, it was just a month after MacArthur's great victory in Inchon, yeah. and uh, and he had, it was it was it was, a, it was a spectacular victory. It was it was a, la a landing that and and he basically the war, some people think the war was actually won could have been won and and uh, and then and then MacArthur decided that we, we, he, he was going to he was going to conquer all of Korea and uh, and and that, that that was then then disaster followed. But it was um, he um, in, in, in all kinds of ways. It was a war that I keep I, I became obsessed by the war. I, uh, when I, I went over there, I, I'm, I'm not good at looking at maps. So one of the one of the valuable things for me was flying over the place and seeing this country that you with mountains. It was a terrible place to fight to fight a war. And uh, and and before it was all over, people people forget or because it's, if they call it the forgotten war. It's not forgotten by the people who were there. There are fewer than yeah. now. 37,000 Americans were killed in, in the Korean War. I don't know how, countless numbers of Koreans, probably a million Chinese. And when it was all over, nothing had changed except that the Koreans had a slight advantage. They, they, they got one city more than they had when they started. And, uh, and, and that was, uh, so it was, a, it was a terrible, 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 terrible war. And it didn't, uh, and that was, uh, and, and, the, and in, when, they, when he met MacArthur, MacArthur assured him that the Chinese were not going to come in. And he said it would yeah. be it would be it would be a, a big slaughter if they did. Well, it was a slaughter, all right, and that, that almost ended the war in, in in the wrong way. The Korean Memorial is wonderful in Washington, uh, and I had, I uh, I think every American should go to to understand the Korean War just from that memorial. It's I agree. very I, affecting and emotional. And I agree. I, and going to the to the war museum in Seoul, Korea, is also. You realize this is this was this is this wasn't our war. This was their war too. Right. We uh, before it was all over. There was basically nothing left in North Korea. Every village, every town burned on, on MacArthur's orders. And South Korea, the same, just extraordinary devastation. And so, and we for, it's, it was so it's so far away. We just don't we, we don't realize that, that what a terrible terrible war it was. And there were again, the South no, Korean were the South Koreans now happy that we were there. I think I think I I think they're happy. I think they're happy now. And I yeah, think that's and what I, I mean. Yeah, but I think, and I say you could, in some way, you could, you could, you could call. Well, what's the problem with having this war? Because South Korea is great; they're making Hyundai's and so, and and uh, and Samsungs. But the, but we've also, but but there, there could have been South Korea without. I think the war. I say I think the war could have ended in September of 1950. It had mm -hmm. ended. And that was. There are so many great stories in this book. So many terrific quotes. As I mentioned yeah. in the beginning, the quotes just drive the narrative, drive yeah, yeah. the reading. One that was kind of interesting, I had not gotten to know about, about Korea and about nukes as well. I never heard the story, it was a short, just a little short paragraph in your book, but hit me that Al Gore Sr., we well, know Al Gore Jr., uh, but Al Gore Sr. proposed an atomic death belt yeah. in between South and North Korea. Did Truman know that idea, and he did express any thoughts about that? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't hear any thoughts. There were, I mean, Lyndon Johnson, Senator Johnson wanted to wanted to bomb with bomb them with nukes too. There was a lot of there were a lot of warlike. Okay, that hasn't changed much, has it? It's, it's no. easier, easier to be a senator and propose a war policy than to actually have to make a decision. But uh, no, Truman, thought, Truman, Truman. Truman thought that the the Cold War though was one yeah. of his legacies. Is that correct? He that, that, that he that his part in it uh, helped set the stage for what eventually occurred. I think he I think what he I think he considered the the Truman Doctrine, which basically basically stopped the expansion of of of, of Soviet Russia into well I mean they, they they never got into Western Europe for example and and so I think he, I think he considers that I think he's no I think he considers his legacy NATO which was a, which has been a, a huge success um, I think um, as you know. Um, when it began to expand, expand 25 years ago, um, George Kennan, who was who was the author, the 
father of the containment, thought it was the most dangerous and, and reckless thing we've done of foreign policy since the war. But that's but that's that, that's another story. He and Truman, but, but uh, Truman, but Truman was not part of that. Truman and and the Marshall Plan was a great great achievement. Uh, it was I mean uh, it was it, again it wasn't Truman's idea, but he certainly but he, he got out of the way and let it happen. And that, and he also was smart enough to let it be called the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not mm -hmm. the Truman plan. And this was, it came in, this was after the Republicans had taken over the House and Senate for the first time since 1928. Do so, you think uh, that Atchison and Marshall led Truman more than Truman led them, that he knew these men were around him and he, he thought that they had ideas that he should follow? I haven't thought of it that way, you're, but you're, I don't think you would, would have ever used the word they led him. But he listened to them, and he and he basically, I can't think of anything where they, apart from the recognition of Israel, where they where he disagreed with them, and he and they and they did. I think there's no question that they guided him and helped him make decisions. Well, you you as a as a historian looking back, yeah, do you think that they did lead him? Oh yeah, I mean sure, they absolutely did, and and in that sense, and 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 I, and and I think um, the, Truman. Truman basically, yeah, Truman, all, they led him because they, I think they knew that he would listen to them. So whatever, and, and in that sense, they, they, they led him, but they left, but I think they, they were, they were, they realized he was the president. So they had to let him, they had to let him lead, but they, but they sure. sort of pushed him in the right direction. Right, George, right. Kennan, George Kennan once said that it was, Truman in effect only had one advisor and that was Dean Atchison. And uh, um, I have behind me uh, a set of his memoirs yeah. Truman that he wrote after the war, uh, after the presidency, of course, yeah. in two volumes. He and Herbert Hoover lived long lives and yeah. they were happy to sign everything that was put before them. Yeah. And so these books are not rare to find inscribed to people. He was happy to do it. Same with Hoover, as I mentioned. How was his writing in this? Is it all his writing? Did he... Uh, what was he saying about those who were enemies or friends before? Did he make any new enemies through the, these this yeah. uh, diary? I think he reawakened some old some old 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 enemies. He the writing was not very good, and he had a lot of help. Um, the parts where I think the real Truman comes through was uh, whenever he whenever he would let loose on Henry Wallace. Or James Burns, who he, who he, who he, who he, who he never sort of got over, and then Eisenhower. Boy, did he let Eisenhower have it in, in the in, when it, basically from the from the '52 campaign when Eisenhower ran against Adlai Stevenson, uh, and Truman, Truman, and, uh, and Truman, who had always they'd always had a pretty, well, actually, a very respectful relationship, and then then it all changed. Truman, I think Truman was personally more deeply offended when when uh, when Eisenhower didn't come to the defense of General Marshall when McCarthy attacked him. Mm -hmm. and, and then when he called, then he would call Marshall. I forget the words he used, but uh, but but the, the 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 essence was morally morally bankrupt. And they and they so after that there was no forgiveness possible. And uh, and he really let Marsh Truman have it. I mean Eisenhower have it in the memoirs, and uh, and, uh, and and actually so actually Dean Atchison let him have it too. Mm. But and which is a and uh, and Eisenhower was Eisenhower wasn't they they they, they were not fond of each other. That's it, by that time they it was a sort of a reconciliation, but not never a real one after that and so on. But anyway, that's the place. That's where Truman's real voice, I think, comes through, where he's where he's sort of where he's sort of letting letting you know how he feels about these people who who we who, who he always was was angry with. Well, and that's kind of nice to to read just for that. But you write that, uh, I'm going to quote, he demonstrated an impressive self-awareness and talent for self-invention. So yeah. maybe elaborate on both those points. Well, I mean, I, th I think the, th the, the, the self-invention the self is the idea that he was this, that, that he was this sort of barefoot boy from Missouri and who, 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 who just took over and, 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 and became, and became this sort of great commander. That didn't really, it, was, it, was, it, it wasn't quite like that. And he had, he did have a lot, a, a, a lot of, a lot of help, and and uh, and and I think he I think he acknowledged that. I, I'm sorry. What was the other th the other thing you see? Well, how how he uh, the, the, his expectations that were were in there as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think, I think he, <laughs> sound <laughs> the ground now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I know I think but he but he 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 just um he was he was when he wrote the, when he wrote these memoirs 
he was a much more confident person than he was when he when he went out when, when Roosevelt died. So he was able to sort of rewrite history. I did this, I did that, I decided this. And then so it's a but, but he, a, he was inward looking as well? Not really. He, that wasn't Truman's that wasn't Truman's strength. No. But he was but he was he was outward looking and he was and he could he could since he was the since he was the author, since it was his history, he he could describe himself as making big decisions, as making good decisions, as changing the world. And that's how, and he, and he could be, and since, and since, and he could have this confidence, he was already, his, his history's view of him had not, was already beginning to change by the time this, these books were published in, in 55 and so on. And he was, he was a far more confident about himself and his role in history than he was when he left office. Well, what about the legacy? Uh, biographers, certainly in the beginning and for a long time, uh, didn't think that there was, greatness in him. Uh, how did uh, his legacy change? Did that last year, for instance, in the no. shakiness, did that uh, impinge upon biographers immediately? And, but how did that legacy change till today? We have a different feel for him. Yeah, Dan, I think that's true. I think I do think, though, that almost right away, there were some, some, some people were beginning to say, some historians were even beginning to say that, that, that he's bigger than we think he is, and so on. And and uh, and he he definitely he grew he grew he as time went on, um, and he grew in the estimation of more and more people. Um, I think I think David McCullough's book was was very important in sort of this sort of saying well, let's 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 give him credit for for for, for, for this for this that and the other. But I think people were already recognized. I mean, how could you deny that that the, the Marshall Plan, NATO, and, uh, and 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 so on? These these were all these were all programs that that were that were his legacy. And and the and the fact that there had not been there there not not been a major war. Korea is this Korea is the one big blot, to me on that on 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 his presidency at the end because because it didn't have to happen not in that way. I think we had to respond. We had to respond to the North Korean attack on South Korea. That for, we couldn't let it stand. Just we couldn't just let them walk over the South. And also and also it was a real test for Truman of the United Nations, which was which he which he had a lot of which he put a lot of value in. But it was, um, but it, it was not a, uh, but it, it was not, a, it was not a great moment in his presidency. No. You had alluded to uh, Joseph McCarthy and yeah. uh, Atchison being attacked by him. I, as a child, I come home from uh, in, or mid grade school, uh, age six, seven, eight, and they were on the TV, and I'd watch. I didn't know what I was watching, but yeah. I saw drama certainly. Uh, one of my cousins actually was called before the McCarthy oh, committee. Really? Yeah. But uh, what did Truman, did he, was he outspoken at all? This is after his presidency, of course, but was he outspoken at all about McCarthy and what was going oh, on? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I mean, McCarthy got sort of, sort of more and more powerful later on, but no, he was definitely, Truman, Truman let McCarthy have it. I mean, McCarthy gave his famous first speech in, in, in Wheeling in, in, in 1950. And Truman, Truman uh, actually there was one press conference when Truman said that McCarthy, McCarthy is the, he's the best friend the Kremlin has. Is, and then he actually, those were the days when, when presidents could take it back. In other words, they had to get they had to get permission to be quoted directly, and they went to Charlie Ross, his press secretary, and said, "Can we use that?" And Truman modified it somewhat, but he was uh, no, he 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 hated McCarthy, he despised McCarthy. McCarthy McCarthy just hadn't really begun to become the powerful person he was. He become the destructive person that he was. He his attack on on General Marshall uh, was uh, was was extraordinary. In fact, in fact, I I. I um, I, I quote some of it in the book, and it's just yeah. people just people just people just people remember just a couple of lines, but it was pretty insane. I mean, some of the things he said. I mean, the idea that Marshall is at the root of of everything, lost China, they uh, they they it was extraordinary and, and 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 crazy and crazy, and and I don't know whether McCarthy McCarthy was McCarthy McCarthy's a, there have been a number of books about McCarthy too, and he. Um, and uh, I think Richard Revere said uh, he wrote the line that he he saw anti-communism as a you know as a as a sort of a great oil and it came up a gusher and he went for it. But I think but after a while I don't I think he began to he he began to sort of uh, <laughs> can really believe the stuff. He had a he was very popular with with journalists because he was great copy. Yeah. But then but but he but but he but then it became more serious. He was he he was he was the. He, he became the arch, you know, the arch villain of her block cartoons, and he became, an, and then, and then he sort of, and then he began to chart the path to his own destruction under Eisenhower. I brought up uh, Herbert Hoover. Truman certainly had 
an effect on Herbert Hoover by bringing him to the o Oval Office. Yes. And uh, Hoover, I, it's known, uh, he, he was given uh, some help to, he, he was asked by Truman to help in Europe, something he had done before yeah. uh, as well. And he was asked to do that. And Hoover went out of the Oval Office and cried. Yeah, he was, Truman was very generous that way. I mean, and uh, I, I don't know the whole story I, between the, 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 the bad feelings between uh, Hoover and Roosevelt. I, I, know, I mean, I know they, 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 they never spoke. I don't think they even wrote to the inauguration together, but that was, but Truman, no. very, Truman, Truman was very generous and really, and really, and really brought him into the game. And, they, and, and, and Hoover appreciated it. Hoover came to the dedication of the Truman Library in, in, in 50, 56. And, and I think that Truman would have, and that Truman had, had fallen down and he would have, so he couldn't go to, he couldn't go to Hoover's funeral, but he would have gone if he could have. It's before. Um, you, I think you mentioned that at the end, as interesting as this book is, by the way, that the Truman presidency is somewhat uninspiring. Is there anything inspiring that we should take away from his presidency? Is there a lasting effect of his presidency that we I think have? What I, I, think what I, I think what I meant to say was Truman himself was not inspiring. He, okay. was, not an, he was not an inspiring personality. He was, he was sort of almost, almost recessive as a personality. He would, um, on, if you watch him, it's painful to watch him to watch him, for example, to, to announcing the announcing the peace and the, the, the surrender of the of Germany, it's painful. When after the bomb was dropped, he he was actually on a ship coming back from 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 Potsdam. But he, but there was a statement that that his uh, that 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 his uh, press secretary read in Washington. But then he take he videoed something of himself, and it's 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 pathetic. I mean, he just see him. He's he's almost he's reading by rote, and he seems to be hardly hardly there. And even as a campaigner, unless he was on his own, unless he was making it up and sort of, in which he could be great fun and sometimes make it up, someone said it sounded like someone reading from the Hindustani. I mean, it was, it yeah. was not, not, not good. So he was, never, he was never an inspiring president and he was never, so what, what, we, what, we, what we remember is what he did, not, not how he was. And, and in fact, that's part of, part of why he has grown in memory because we see, we see, this, we see this person, this post-presidential Harry Truman, this fun, Fun, quotable, um, always, always there, and uh, you know, going, you know, tra traveling all over the place. And he was, uh, and that was the, that's the Truman that we, we all begin to, to remember. But as president, he was not a greatly inspiring figure. Quite, quite the contrary. Uh, you know, these are events 60, 70 more years ago. Yeah. Uh, but you had lunch. It's interesting as an historian to be able to have lunch with one of the characters main characters in your book, and that's Dean no, Acheson. No, his son, his son, David. I mean, his, his, yeah, I'm saying his son is what I'm saying in 2018. Yeah, yeah he, and David was 93. And, and the then. son is a direct, uh, direct line to the father. Oh, yeah. And he must have, did, did he represent his father, do you think? Did he try to keep up the legacy of his father, or did he... Uh, get into other areas and maybe some areas that we don't think are as, as fondly memory for actress and himself. Well, David, I really, really got to like David. He looks like his father too, by the way. You could, you, if you saw him in a crowd, you'd say, "My God, there's Dean Acheson," mm. and, uh, and he was, he was wonderful. He, no, he was, all, he was all ter completely loyal to his father. He thought that his father, the, the most interesting thing. I mean, there were many interesting things, but one was there, there was a wonderful car collection of correspondence between Acheson and Truman. There was all, there was all post-presidential and they go, it's fast. I recommend everyone get a copy of it because you can see now here's Truman letting loose to Jimmy Burns, for example, saying this guy was trying to run, run for president over my head. And he calls, he, call, he refers to, he refers to Stalin as that little son of a bitch. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's pure Truman. And, 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 uh, and, and David Acheson was behind it and Margaret Truman tried to stop it. Margaret Truman tried to stop, stop, he thought it, it didn't show the dignity of the presidency and, mm -hmm. and it came out after Margaret died and David told me about this and I thought that was quite interesting. And, uh, but David was, and David was very, very, David Atchison was very extremely, extreme, I, I don't think I ever, I think I called him Mr. Atchison, never David. And he was, he was very loyal to his father's memory and, and, and really, and, and there was never, never any wavering then. He thought that his father, 
he said, well, it's, you know, his father, he did admire Truman and he, he did dedicate his book to the captain with a mighty heart, but he thought Truman was too political and too, and too, and too quick and, and too quick to, I think it, actually, he actually wrote someplace that his, his mouth works faster than his mind. And he, he did feel that about Truman, but, uh, but he, but he yeah, definitely. Was there, is there anything, we're, we're really at the end of our time. Is oh, there no. anything <laughs> surprising that you came out of this with Truman, especially since you started out with uh, Eisenhower and Nixon and then went back to Truman. Is there anything surprising that, that came to you that you like to impart to us? There's one thing, it's interesting. I, I, I feel like I got, when I feel like I really got to know him, I was, when I was in, when I was in Independence and I've got a wonderful guy who works for the Department of the Interior. The, the house in Grandview was being, I couldn't get into it, it was closed. And he said, I'll, I'll take this. And he took me into it. We went through, we went through it. And going upstairs to the back stairs and seeing where Truman lived for basically 10 years in this, I mean, he, they were not a poor family, but I, I've lived in the country and I know what it's like to wake up on a cold morning and uh, not, like, not like they did. And they had one, one stove and he, had, he shared a room with his brother Vivian, two beds in one room with one chamber pot under the bed. And you just mm. have to think about, my God. And this is, and he was there for 10 years. And you begin to say, oh, this is this is where he came from. This is this is this is this this is this man. He this is, and he had a lot of guts, and he had a lot of strength. And that's what also what what he brought to, when he what he what he brought to to the war, uh, for the first World War, where he was, where even despite having bad eyesight, he became he was he got promoted to captain. And even though he was a, a mason and never, you know, as <laughs> um, he had a, a lot of Irish Catholics around him, he got to, to and, he, and they liked him and he commanded them. And he was he began to, then you began to see where it all came from. And it was it was a he was for real, and that's what, and that's so it just, it didn't come out of nothing. This yeah. Truman's 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 strength, and that's what I began to see, and then all the rest of it began to follow his mistakes, all of it, and but 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 the but the strength was always there, and the honor was always there, even even when he, I mean, not even when he dissembled and when he and even when he made it up, and I think that's what I came away from. What came away with. Did the Truman Lie? Does the Truman Library represent the man fairly? Well, now it does. I think it's probably like all present, like all. Like, like, I think he wanted it to be a happier view at first, but everything he let, nothing was hidden. It's all there. The library is wonderful. I was yeah. going to say, I think it's the, maybe the best library and the, the archivists were, were terrific too. I don't know. I mean, the Eisenhower library is also pretty, pretty, pretty wonderful. And I've, I've, and I've been to some bad, the, the Nixon library was, 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 was a much more interesting and bifurcated place when I was out there. But the Truman library, was the, was, it was the first under the National Archives and Record Administration too. And it was, and they and it's uh, it's a it's a terrific terrific library and I hope that I hope that the last president whose name I never mentioned in the book tries to hope that that, that thank you follows, <laughs> not even in the index but, but I hope that the that the that the National Archives and Records Administration can take some some control of it so there's some some historical record even though a lot of it's going to be lost in tweets yeah. and, and so on. well we've been talking to Jeffrey Frank and uh, about his wonderful new book on the uh, Truman presidency. The Trials of Harry S. Truman, The Extraordinary Presidency of an Ordinary Man, 1945 to 1953. And uh, I enjoyed this because I, I, third time I'm saying this, the narrative just went along because of all the interesting people that you ferreted out around him as well and the quotes that come with it. So this is, today was the day of release and we appreciate that. And those of you uh, who are watching right now can still get uh, Dave release book plate, and uh, you can, if you're watching later over C-SPAN, we'll still have book plates just like this that uh, uh, Jeffrey had signed for us, and we'll have those as well. We want to thank C-SPAN for carrying our interviews, and all of you for watching us as well. You can go over our website, alinkinbookshop.com, to be a part of all of our interviews, and our artifact shows. Thank you for being with us. Goodbye and be safe.